in San Francisco. Looks really good, Peter. Okay, we've got it up. <laughs> Sorry, I was uh, making sure that I I had that connection. Is is uh, okay on your screen? Yep, looks okay. good. Okay. Thanks well, for being here. My, the subject of my talk reflects um, a recent shift in emphasis in ecological restoration and its public funding. Uh, climate change adaptation, especially sea level rise adaptation and management of um, coastal flooding and erosion is driving large scale infrastructure projects that include nature-based and living shoreline components. These often rely on <laughs> These often rely on um, native vegetation as ecosystem engineers instead of just hard gray structures. Using native plants as workhorses for coastal engineering is nothing new. People have been practicing pre-scientific folk technology like for centuries. Um, and I'm going to start by focusing on two particular native species, one widespread Circumboreal beach plant, um, Lemus mollus, uh, American dune grass, and has some common names, and one California endemic salt marsh plant, federally endangered, state unlisted, um, California sea blight, Sueda californica. And they both have important functional traits that take on a new significance for managing submergence and retreat of the San Francisco coast. So that was my start. Let's see if we can get to. The beginning. So here's the context um, for why I'm talking about San Francisco's public works projects coming up for um, sea level rise adaptation um, in the context of ecological restoration. Um, both the bay shoreline and the um, ocean beach shoreline are right now undergoing large scale, large geographic plans for um, reconfiguration to address sea level rise. And unlike traditional um, shoreline armoring projects, seawall construction projects, bulkheads that pretty much exclude all restoration components, all of them are now looking at the start at using um, either nature-based living shoreline, green infrastructure or, uh, elements to um, either incorporate them to, to, as, as ecological amenities, or in some cases to actually incorporate in their basic functions. Um, so I'll just point to one project. I'm, I'm only involved in, in a limited capacity as um, a technical advisor and part of a, a, a large panel, and that is the um, uh, San Francisco, Port of San Francisco Waterfront Resilience Program, which is uh, featuring engineering nature-based solutions for um, uh, shoreline retreat. And you can see some of the descriptions of uh, of what it, they're planning on doing. I think this is gonna be an ongoing project for an, a number of years. Um, the, the main thrust for a, a restoration context is that everything is on artificial habitat. You can see from this graphic from San Francisco Estuary Institute, um, the current shoreline is completely disconnected from the original uh, San Francisco Bay shore. There's no connection with the natural shoreline, it's geology, soils, or topography. So it is totally uh, new landscapes that we're trying to retrofit, incorporate some of, not, not facsimiles of anything that was lost, that's no longer possible, um, but in the process of adapting to, to uh, shoreline retreat, we may be able to bring back functional components of those ecosystems, including some of the species, and create new places for them, not necessarily for themselves, but because of the, um, additional ecological functions they provide that benefit flooding protection and um, erosion control. So the other large scale project, which is kind of an offshoot from the um, uh, Ocean Beach Master Plan is the um, Ocean Beach Climate Change Adaptation Project, which focuses on um, uh, the areas south of Sloat to Fort Funston. Uh, this is driven by the need to protect the wastewater treatment plants um, uh, and also the tunnel that conveys uh, uh, treated wastewater um, and, and other, other <laughs> um, water infrastructure along what's now currently um, Great Highway. Um, this section of the coast is proposed currently for um, a setback approach, disconnection from the um, active part of Great Highway, the construction of a large uh, public use trail and a service road, 
and the creation of new uh, stabilized back dunes and an active new fore dune perched on a, a slightly cemented wall that's set back from the current shoreline. So um, it, the idea is to soften the shoreline, protect the beach while also protecting infrastructure in a very tight space. Um, this is not an easy trick. Uh, it involves large scale movements of you know, beach sand from North Ocean Beach or offshore. It will require um, the creation of managed vegetated fore dunes to deal with blowing sand from sand placement. Um, it also needs to manage internally things like runoff uh, 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 from, from roads and, and, uh, and trails. Um, so it will require not traditional ecological restoration of a natural community, but components of them as basic functional um, aspects of the, the new landscape. So here's a look uh, before we get into the species of what the potential roles for at least one of the species I'll be covering tonight, which is Lamus mollus, um, American dune grass or beach wild rye. Um, here you can see in, in this sort of crude cartoon conceptual cross section, the, because of the very tight space needed to manage blowing sand and uh, ongoing repeated uh, beach renourishment on the eroding section of the um, the ocean beach um, shoreline, uh, there, there needs to be a, a, a set back, a low profile wall to protect um, buried infrastructure behind Undergreen's Great Highway. The um, position of that low profile, profile wall is not where the current shoreline is, but well landward. So there's new, new space being proposed to be created for um, Ocean Beach, which actually is restoring what used to be the original shoreline. Ocean Beach um, Great Highway was actually built out into the beach, so it uh, is not a natural shoreline position. So this sets it back a little bit to where it was in the 19th century, and um, there's a need to create four dunes to trap sand blowing on shore so it doesn't cover all the new infrastructure, the roads, the trails. And that means employing native species because um, virtually all resource and regulatory agencies will prohibit the use of more practical European beach grass or marum grass, which was used in the 1980s to stabilize the Great Highway for dunes. Um, so this is sort of a, a preliminary look. This is not a final plan. This is an early draft form. Um, and um, I'll just point out one part that's in review, kind of in flux that is relevant to um, the use of native species, and that is that the, the dunes placed on a cemented wall with limited permeability that cuts off the dunes from groundwater and deep sand with moisture below surface means a very confined root system. Uh, the rooting zone is very shallow, and that may mean having supplemental sources of moisture that would otherwise be available to four dune species. So again, this is going to be a uh, uh, a very tight space and <laughs> working in uh, compact ecological spaces as well. So there's a fair amount of artifice, not traditional um, uh, ecological restoration, maximizing natural processes. Well, here's the, um, the lead ecosystem engineer species for, for that purpose in beaches and fore dunes. Um, this is probably the only major native fore dune grass species along the Pacific coast. Um, it has an incredibly large range. It's one of its uh, common names is American dune grass, but that really is a misnomer on multiple counts. For one, it is native through much of circumboreal Asia and North America and parts of Europe. Um, probably more of its range is in Siberia <laughs> and the Korea, China, uh, than in, uh, in California or uh, even the United States. Um, it ranges in California as far south as um, Point Sal, I believe. There are good stands of it in Morro Bay. So it ranges down to the south, south central coast, um, but really it is primarily a northern species, a boreal species. It's really um, an abundant species in places like um, uh, the Alaskan coast and Hudson Bay, um, extreme cold tolerant. And unlike European beach grass or marum grass, uh, it is primarily restricted to beaches and fore dunes. One of its common names is strand grass. So it has a different niche 
from the more widely adaptive, widely adapted European beach grass, which colonizes not just the beach in a marginal way, but uh, also, also uh, interior dunes. This is sort of the reverse. Um, uh, Lanus mollis is more salt tolerant. It is uh, better adapted to beach and uh, foggy salt spray influenced for dunes and diminishes rapidly um, with inland dunes. And here's a, just a close up look of one of those adaptations. You might, may notice if you see uh, Lanus mollis in San Francisco or Pacifica or any of the other coastal areas around where you can still find stands of this native grass, um, it has um, flat leaves that don't, that don't roll up very easily, unlike uh, European beach grass, Amophila, which has tightly involute or rolled up leaves that expose that hardened surface to salt spray. The leaves of um, uh, Lanus mollis tend to be flat and open most times of the year, so they do lose a little more water in any given day. They are more exposed to uh, evapotranspiration. They're a little less drought tolerant, greater need to be on the moist beach, close to beach groundwater. And they also have another adaptation, adaptation in which uh, fog drip, like on redwood leaves, directly condenses on the leaf and it actually rolls down and fills those little collars at the junction between the blade, the ligule and, and the sheath and fills up little pools, sometimes dragging sand down that acts like a sponge. You can actually see growth spurts after very foggy, misty days when the plant will basically pull water out of coastal fog, it'll drip down to its own roots, it'll run down the stem. Um, anyway, I, I brought this, this bit of ecological detail up to point out that this is really a maritime for dune and beach species, which is exactly where we really need um, to do <laughs> restoration right now in, in San Francisco. So it's primarily adapted to that zone and has many attributes that are really well adapted to, uh, to growth and survival on beaches, greater salt tolerance, uh, this fog drip absorption of water, and also a widely creeping spreading habit, which um, regenerates the plant extensively after, after erosional events. Well, even though it's very well adapted to the San Francisco shoreline, historically, there are very few records of this species, po uh, possibly because the original San Francisco outer lands dune system was primarily a, a massive, unstable mobile dune sheet. There was never a four dune ridge uh, in, in San Francisco that anyone has any record of until European beach grass was introduced and placed behind large wooden walls that trapped sand and beach grass was planted behind it to build a linear ridge that later became Great Highway. Um, Lanus mollus was um, uh, the only, only uh, 20th century, early 20th century record was up by the Cliff House, uh, the slopes around Sutro Baths, which it, are still there and, and there's a trace of it still present. And it's circulating in the area because it does show up on our beaches. Um, but uh, Bear and Brandigy found uh, no, did not record it. Bear was a little biased against grasses, but Brandigy recorded other species of Elemis, as it was then called, um, just wasn't present. But today there are more populations, mostly reintroduced around Baker Beach, uh, Chrissy Field, and one at Pier 94. So there's more of it confirmed now than was known to be present in the 19th century. So it was a minor species. Most of the um, native four dune and interior dune species were primarily um, broadleafed, mat forming, creeping, prostrate um, uh, broadleaf plants uh, like Abronia latifolia and particularly Ambrosia chandisonis beech burr and yellow sand verbena. Um, so these formed scattered hummocks. So, so the, the dune system was completely transmissive. It allowed free sand to move. This is why restoration <laughs> of the original dunes is really not feasible anymore. We have a city here. Um, free dune migration is no longer tolerable. So really managing um, sand in the current shoreline requires intercepting onshore blown sand, concentrating it and stabilizing it in place and then releasing it back to the beach during erosion events. And that's what dune grasses tend to do. They tend to build uh, four dune ridges. And you can see <laughs> this uncanny similarity between the currently highly degraded dunes, those that's plant and the color photo, 2022. Um, but 
geomorphically very similar to the original native dunes uh, from 1917, from Ramillay's uh, account of San Francisco dune vegetation in the outer, what's now the outer sunset, then we're just the outside lands. So our currently degraded and intolerably unmanaged dunes are really more a closer approximation of what we would set as goals for true restoration, literal 19th century restoration. I think it is a foreclosed um, endeavor. Uh, here is just a view of that little remnant of uh, Beach Wild Rye. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, Landis Mollus, Beach Wild Rye, American Dune Grass, uh, just barely persisting above the um, uh, remnants of Sutro Baths. And there are other remnant populations of Lanus mollus around Pacifica, which at one time was relatively continuous with San Francisco dunes. In fact, it, 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 they're probably derived from the same original dune sheet um, that uh, uh, extended at lower sea levels across um, uh, the San Francisco Peninsula. And here you can see it, uh, it co-occurring with some um, uh, ice plant over at the Esplanade Bluffs in Pacific, North Pacifica, and it dominates a restored ore dune at uh, Lindemar uh, at Pacifica State Beach. I don't know the current status at Sharp Park. It used to be on some of the old overwash fans uh, by the border of the uh, southwest corner of the lagoon. Um, and uh, I'm not sure where the current status is right there. Somebody might look for it, but it's all kinds of stuff. Um, it also it thrives apparently in larger populations than occurred historically at North Fort Funston. Um, this is just at the junction between Great Highway and Fort Funston. There's a beautiful large population right at the crest of the perched dunes. These are not true four dunes. These are dunes that are formed by erosion of the Colma Bluffs. So these are recycled Ice Age beach and dune sands that are eroded off the bluff blown landward. You can see the difference in that. The color of the sand is sort of a, uh, a warm ochre color. That's iron oxide from the weathering of those 10 to 20,000 year old sands. Um, they're a little finer than most ocean beach sands and uh, they thrive up there. They have unconfined root systems and they also slump down the eroding bluffs and they've started new populations on the seaward face of Fort Funston and they actually crawl out onto the beach um, as, at the toe and that's only since in the last four or five years since the last major erosion event, but they're incredibly resilient plants. And because they allocate more growth to their lateral creeping rhizomes uh, than they do to um, clumps of large dense vertical um, growth, like European beach grass, they spread very rapidly in a horizontal direction and this create wide mounding dunes rather than steep narrow hummocks or, or ridges. Um, Unfortunately, they uh, were not used in the last um, dune, uh, I shouldn't say restoration, it was a, an artificial dune ridge uh, built by San Francisco Water in the city um, in, in 1985. Uh, it was not exactly dune sand, it was sand from various sources um, and massive amounts of European beach grass, uh, marum grass, were imported from Florence, Oregon, with beach grass uh, nurseries, the only Pacific Coast commercial supply in, in the quantities needed. So um, this is how we got the, the uh, Great Highway um, Ocean Beach Dunes. <laughs> um, corn rows of Amophila planted in mass. Uh, the supply of um, Lamus mollus was small and insufficient. Talk about more about why there was that bias to just reach for European beach grass a little later. I think there's an explanation there. But despite the overwhelming initial dominance of uh, Amophila arenaria on that constructed dune, here you can see by August 2009, a colony of Lamus mollus that initiated back around 19, early 1990s expanded in kind of nested in between stands of, of Amophila and it actually grew um, and held its own and widened in places that were not previously occupied by Amophila at one location near Irving Street. So this is a little oasis of native dune habitat. You know, you wouldn't, in 2009, you wouldn't have bet on it lasting another decade. However, 2019, that unmanaged Lamus Mollus patch 
which has always been, um, let's say, disparaged as a comparable dune builder and stabilizer relative to European beach grass based on many decades of um, dune, stabilization, dune stabilization experience in the Pacific Northwest, it seemed to do just fine. And this is without any management from either uh, Golden Gate National Recreation Area or the city. It's kind of in the ocean beach no man's land. It's between jurisdictions or overlapping jurisdictions and no one was doing anything here. But it was that, that area was growing. And by 2021, you can see it now, it's actually overtaken Amophila, which probably has to do with its lateral spread. Um, and I, I, I don't only speculate the many reasons, but the fact of it is that that unmanaged Lamus Mollus stand made of dune grass has crested the four dunes and it has become coalesced with multiple colonies and it now spread at a considerable area, um, again, centered around uh, Irving Street. So this puts a lie to the idea that only European beach grass can stabilize four dunes in these tight um, spaces. This is another view of that same stand. It's maintaining chronic high sand deposition on the order of about 20 to 30 centimeters per year. And uh, it's extensive and fairly linear, linear on that um, seaward slope. Um, it, Amophila takes over on the landward side. And uh, here you can see the two growing together. Uh, it it kind of begs the question about whether, at least in, at some rates of sand accretion or in some circumstances, whether Lamus mollus can achieve in four dunes, not in landward dunes or in you know, massive parabolic dunes or tr inland transverse dunes, but in four dunes, whether there is a functional equivalence or near equivalence between Lamus mollus and Amophila. Again, this is an unplanned experiment. It uh, uh, sort of passively occurred, but the slopes of the Amophila arenaria dunes, this is again, just, just north of, of Irving, very similar to Lamus mollus. And again, Lamus mollus has spread and Amophila has actually retreated a bit. Um, again, it's uh, from a, all derived from a, a Lamus mollus secondary colonization event around the early nineties. And here's what it looks like on the land side downwind side of that Lamus mollus or dune, right where it transitions to Amophila closer to Lincoln. This is the original soil that was imported for the construction of that artificial four dune in 1985. And it's 100% or nearly 100% um, ice plant. There are little patches of coyote brush and some myoporum. But that's the original unburied imported sand surface. And you can see all of the ocean beach sand for the almost the last 40 years has been intercepted and trapped on the seaward side of that four dune. So there should be no question that intact stands of both Amophila and Lamus can do the job of preventing landward sand transgression. And in this reach, this is not where sand grading and removal operations that are very costly for the city are occurring. It occurs just at Judah and um, South. And I'll show you what that looks like. Um, but it first begs the question of why was Amophila exclusively planted in that original 1985 project that we inherited? And why was Lamus mollus minimized in dune stabilization, both in California and the Pacific Northwest? Well, I, I went back to some of the earlier um, reclamation literature on dune stabilization of the Pacific coast. And it's very, very well done. It's very experienced and, and uh, thoughtful. But this dune stabilization era is different from what we're doing now. These were land reclamation goals for agriculture and uh, timberlands. This is the depression era when cost was effective and non-native species invasions meant nothing. And native restoration, native plant restoration meant nothing. So the, the reason cited for the practical disadvantages of Lamus mollus was, well, there wasn't a lot of it. <laughs> so they, they, uh, they, they, it had slightly slower growth and limited stock. Well, we can see that can be reversed with some effort. It was a relatively higher cost per acre than the cheapest species, Amophila, in the 1930s. Well, we're spending a lot more now on coastal infrastructure uh, than, we, than we did in the 1930s. So maybe the cost per acre of Lamus versus Amophila is not a big driver for projects like those at Ocean Beach anymore, at least in, in California. 
Um, a big a big constraint that I mentioned was that there was high survivorship of lamus during dormancy only, so it was a shorter planting season. Again, not a huge deal, but if you're working with um, WPA crews in the 30s, I guess it was. And this is the last one. It only grew well close to the beach in four dune, and uh, it doesn't work very well in interior dunes. Well, again, that's not an issue. Golden Gate Park and the sunset already occupy that zone. So we're only interested right now in what we can do in the four dunes. So none of these constraints that really became an historical legacy that today constrains the use of Lamus Mollus, none of this really applies. Um, so I'm hopeful that we'll find a new role for this species in, in uh, renovation of San Francisco dunes. And here's another thing about you know, the Amophila versus Lamus aspect. Uh, of, of uh, redoing the ocean beach dunes, um, Amophila is not particularly tolerant of trampling. And as you can see in this time series photo from September 2008, 2014 and 2021, there are more photos, I just picked these three, um, the big blowouts at Judah evolved, and this is an eyewitness account, <laughs> I was, I've been here since the 80s off and on, um, those blowouts evolved from fan-shaped divergent trampling pads. This is a common way dune blowouts formed, but it's not the ocean overwhelming the dunes. This is an opening created by unmitigated, unmanaged, uncontrolled trampling from the Judah cross light, uh, uh, stoplights, crosswalks at um, Great Highway. And as you can see, the adjacent areas are not blown out. It's just in the areas of the crossing where that fan-shaped trail network um, undercut with the wind, slumped, uh, created moving dunes, and now, of course, they're migrating directly over Great Highway with great maintenance costs. So it's not a physical factor, it's a vegetative factor. And this is the result. It looks like a, a, you know, a physically forced dune. You don't see any vegetative influence there. That's because the vegetative influence was removed, and now you're seeing the long-term release of stored sand, you know, probably 20, 30 years of sand stored in that four dune released in about 10 years. So it's, um, it, it's not just a physical process. It is now because there's no plants, um, but that was not the origin of that problem. And Lamus mollus is probably better at self-sealing blowouts because it has a more extensively creeping habit at least in the four dune zone where it intercepts uh, both sand and salt spray and, and uh, coastal fog. And you can see, a, a, again, a long lost demonstration of this indirectly um, at the Caraval seawall or the Noriega Santiago seawall. This is the quote, new seawall built in the uh, 1990s. And for a long time, uh, you know, when rips um, form in the beach, uh, rip current zones, Erosion proceeds all the way to the seawall, but in periods when the beach progrades and rebuilds itself, natural fragments of Lamus, Mollus, and Ammophila and other native um, species that regenerate from, from seeds like Abronia and uh, Ambrosia, they colonize the high tide line. They colonize the drift lines, the racks on the beach. No one planted these four dunes. These are spontaneously formed four dunes from 19, well, the, the photos from 19, 87, when they probably were about six years old, five, six years old. And uh, you can see that the more salt tolerant and more widely creeping Lamus actually has the lead in this section of embryonic low four dunes because it, it spreads faster on the beach. And here you see a little tuft of Amophila and extensive little low ridge. And you can see a gap between the four dunes and the seawall. That's because the four dunes are intercepting a lot of that sand and not letting it blow on the beach. But the prescription for the seawall was, this is my understanding, um, when the sand gets to the height of the seawall, you have to grade it down. That's part of the maintenance. So they just removed all of the four dunes that were starting to stabilize the sand. It seems a bit counterproductive to me, or at least it's an open question. Um, the, since then, I, I believe this has been chronically graded and replaced. This is a potential reapplication of the natural ecosystem engineering abilities of Lamus mollus, as well as other compatible species. There are uh, native plants like Abronia and Ambrosia that are prostrate and are not as efficient at building dunes and trapping sand, but are compatible with Lamus mollus. So this is being re 
investigated in a San Francisco Estuary Institute led uh, project for uh, improving the, res the ecological resilience of the sunset and improving habitat for humans as well. Early planning stages. Um, this is one of the places we're thinking of uh, possibly extending the Lamus Mollus Fordune from Irving and uh, the Irving vicinity of Great Highway. It's an approximate visualization alignment of where that high tide line might be if the beach weren't mined and graded here to supply South Ocean Beach. Um, right now, this isn't. This looks like a beach, but in fact, you can see low transverse dunes, shore parallel dunes that migrate in waves from the active shoreline where the, the back backwash and swash is breaking. These are actually low dunes without any vegetation, and you can see if if we allowed. Lamus and other dune plants to establish, as I just showed you here at the high tide line, they colonize spontaneously unless you trample them out and grade them out chronically. One possibility is to jumpstart these with nuclei of um, four dunes, little embryo four dunes is the jargon, um, in a, a protected zone that would still potentially allow public access and uh, access to the beach related to the crosswalks. Um, but the difference in function would be that the four dune would trap sand and then release it during storms back to the beach, but not let it migrate continuously to the interior, um, to the back where it has to be graded out mechanically. So it, again, it's not restoration. This is not the way San Francisco dunes used to work. They used to migrate inland for miles. Um, but under current infrastructure, this is probably um, um, a better compromise or a reconciliation of um, natural processes and current uh, urban shore needs. Here's sort of a visualization of how that might lay out. Some of the, um, the stairwells would um, be connected to the beach with um, uh, symbolically fenced or otherwise um, compatible pathways through four dunes, but um, a series of horizontally spreading embryo dunes dominated by Lamus, but also including other native, native associated species, sand verbena um, uh, added to the, the most common abronia and ambrosia colonies. Um, this could be a, a native extension of uh, the, the Fordun Ridge uh, that's uh, south of Lincoln. And here is a visualization, a real visualization of what it might look like after about 10, 15 years. Um, this is, uh, again, a side view of that uh, Lamus dominated, naturally formed four dune uh, near Irving. And that, that could be part of the future of North Ocean Beach uh, near the O'Shaughnessy Seawall. And again, just to point out that native, other native species may be compatible with um, a native Fordun, modified native Fordun restoration. This is beech pea, Lathyrus literal, silvery beech pea, Lathyrus literalis, historically native to San Francisco, at least at one location near the Lake Merced, the historic Lake Merced outlet, uh, which is now pretty much where Sloat is. Um, it tends to occur near uh, stream outlets or lagoon shores. And uh, it, here you can see an example at Point Reyes National Seashore near Abbott's Lagoon, where it co-occurs and, and intermixes with uh, Lamus mollus forming a, a nitrogen fixing ground layer, providing roughness closer to the dune surface. Um, very nice practical mix that could be um, somewhat artificially engineered um, in, I think, a, an environmentally acceptable way for um, new ocean beach forests. There are other species in San Francisco with slightly different niches. This is another one that may be extirpated. It's Lamus ex Vancouveriensis. The, natural hybrid uh, Vancouver wild rice. It's, it's um, a hybrid of Lamus mollus and the more widely adapted floodplain and seasonal wetland species Lamus triticoides, creeping wild rye or alkali wild rye. And um, it has that intermediate niche. It grows near beaches, usually within pollination distance of Lamus mollus, but it occupies uh, dune slacks, uh, floodplain terraces, stream mouths, um, it, it may have new life also in that uh, south of Sloat Ocean Beach climate change adaptation project because it is going to require um, basins to deal with runoff from roads and trails. Um, it's a stormwater management requirement in the city. 
And this species is equally well adapted to low dunes and to seasonally flooded basins. It combines the two traits of its two parent species. Uh, this is a stand that has uh, uh, developed at the mouth of Pedro Creek in Pacifica, and potentially it may get a leg up um, in the uh, South of Ocean, South Ocean Beach project in uh, storm infil stormwater infiltration basins, uh, actually very close to its natural historic locality. Um, it's, um, are there are other species that it can associate with too, including Juncus lasterii um, and um, another Lamus species, Lamus pacificus, which also hybridizes uh, with Lamus triticoides. Um, Lamus pacificus is Pacific wild rye, really hard to identify, it rarely flowers, but it is present in San Francisco and is a great turf grass at Prissy Field and in parts of the Presidio. So again, all of these minor and sometimes extirpated or highly reduced historical um, coastal species may have a new life because of new coastal infrastructure needs. Uh, switching to wetlands, if I still have time. Uh, yeah, well, we're you getting do. down there. You do have time. <laughs> okay. uh, <laughs> sorry, I run a little free here. Uh, switching to the bay shore of San Francisco, uh, this is the uh, a perspective from the uh, Port of San Francisco's Waterfront Resilience Program. There are lots of salt marsh species that we you know, try to fit into living shoreline designs, but most people avoid like the plague anything that has listed uh, endangered species status because every, almost all agencies are afraid of um, draconian protections or restrictions on land uses. So it's very hard to get public agencies to willingly accept use of endangered species used because they're in, introduced for their own sake and they come with, they're, they're treated as very fragile, um, uh, uh, maintenance dependent <laughs> uh, populations and they get everyone away. Well, I'm gonna try to convince you that at least one endangered salt marsh species is essentially a, a weed that's got listed species status because of historical circumstances and has incredible adaptability and ecosystem services provided if we allow it to go where it's supposed to go. Um, anyway, it is Fueda uh, californica, California sea blight, uh, California endemic, native to San Francisco Bay, which may have historically been the largest populations in the state, and also Morro Bay and a little bit on the adjacent coast. Um, you'll see in uh, Cal Flora and other records, there are some, uh, many records in Southern California that are invalid. Those are um, an artifact of an earlier taxonomy, that Sueda taxifolia, it's a separate species, and some in Sueda esteroa. True Sueda californica is just Morro Bay and San Francisco Bay. It was extirpated in San Francisco Bay um, around 1960, and it's been sort of uh, experimentally brought back by Fish and Wildlife Service. Actually, I did a lot of that when I was at Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, it is native to estuarine beaches, uh, usually um, uh, uh, wave sheltered beaches backing into salt marshes. And it may have new uses because of its naturally transition zone multi-niche orientation, you may be able to use it in uh, constructed coarse pocket beaches or habitat enhanced revetments made of boulder cobble that include interstitial, um, you know, fill, filling in the gaps, sediment with, with um, uh, uh, sand and mud. Uh, it may actually be compatible within revetments, as you can see in this riprap shoreline at Tidewater Park in Morro Bay, very happy. Uh, and vigorous uh, California sea blight with zero protection in a high public use area. Um, and in terms of ecosystem engineering traits, very desirable traits in one species. It's a shrub, it's not a sub shrub, it's not really a succulent like pickleweed. It um, grows taller it, than pickleweed, it forms a large shrubby mounding habit, it can spread laterally at phenomenal rates. And it also is able to climb up other structures um, like a liana. It has a thick leaf can canopy and it spreads clonally. It can actually layer and root in substrate or new root systems. So it can, can anchor itself 
wild erosion prestige. Those are all very useful traits for a retreating wave beaten shoreline subject to storm erosion, as I'll show you in some examples. And in addition, it also provides perching bird um, and foraging habitat. Um, we'll see this, this example at Tiburon is, is infested with meadow larks. They use it uh, quite, quite often. And uh, in a salt marsh context, it may provide high tide refuge for salt marsh wildlife because its canopy towers over all other salt marsh species. Well, here's one example of California sea blight that was introduced experimentally to a research site in Tiburon uh, by Catherine Boyer and her graduate students, uh, Kelly Santos, uh, in I think 2016 or 17. This is at Blackie's Pasture in Tiburon. The population was wiped out by storms in 2017, and they all regenerated from tiny fragments. They're now massive mounding uh, shrubs, so they're in, very resilient to storm erosion, which is exactly why we would put them into the ecosystem to begin with. Um, we, they've been brought back to San Francisco Bay under various pilot projects, not full-blown research projects, uh, since the around the around 2000, actually. I'll go through some examples. Um, and uh, San Francisco State Boyer Lab has uh, have been working on populations at various locations. Uh, 2005, 2008, and 2016. So they're scattered around the bay. I'll show you some examples. The historic range of California sea blight in San Francisco was sort of limited. Um, uh, Bredigy found it, reported it in southeastern San Francisco and Visitation Bay, uh, circled in approximate uh, the original shoreline areas. These are pretty much <laughs> no longer in existence. So it's a general geographic area. That, that, that is pointed out here. Um, their habitat affiliation was always in areas where US Coast Survey uh, maps show small sand barrier beaches, or in some cases, uh, Olympia oyster shell beach ridges uh, from fossil deposits, eroded fossil deposits, but always in association with salt marshes. The main populations were East Bay, uh, Richmond to Alameda, mostly around Bay Farm Island, where most of the uh, collections occurred. Almost, well, actually all of those were obliterated. Um, by, because it, its habitat preferences were in areas of the most intense urbanization in Oakland, San Francisco, Berkeley, all of those uh, beaches were completely wiped out in uh, port and uh, urban expansion in the, 19, in the 20th century. Uh, some of the records you'll see on cow flora are errors. Um, the ones from Fremont are another species. Um, easy to make a keying error, but um, to know the species, they, they don't really look much alike. And uh, one of the first successful reintroduction sites was in um, very urbanized derelict, at the time, derelict shoreline at Pier 94. Um, Noreen, of course, has been uh, working on this site uh, in her uh, Golden Gate Audubon capacity uh, with Port of San Francisco for many years uh, for various habitat enhancements. Um, in 2005, Golden Gate Audubon um, sponsored a very low-tech, um, small-scale, recycled waste sand beach nourishment project using the screenings or the, the byproducts of San Francisco Bay sand mining processed at the Hanson facility next to Pier 94. We split, spread what they normally have to truck away. We spread it out in the shoreline and uh, did some of the first pilot plantings of, of Sueda Californica. They are still there. The plant grows very rapidly, despite the fact that the underlying substrate is mostly concrete and rubble, in some cases serpentine. So very shallow rooting, but it's held on there. Um, uh, San Francisco uh, State, the Boyer Lab has done experimental plantings showing that some of these plants can grow two meters a year horizontally. Um, and uh, they, they, even though the shorelines are very active and eroding, they have persisted, again, by rerouting, eroding in parts of the clone and rerouting in other parts of the clone. I'll show you more examples later. They have flowered and reproduced variable rates um, uh, since they were planted, um, usually the first year after transplanting, they will flower and produce seeds. There has been episodic seedling colonization. Seedling colonization is not very frequent, even in Morro Bay, but uh, they do it. And uh, we've actually had more than one generation of naturally producing plants or and a couple other sites, including Heron's Head and Heron's Head, I'll show you, is they've spread to India Basin. They tend to die <laughs> and get eroded, but uh, that's what they do. That's their natural pattern. Uh, but anyway, we've had a long-term persistence of these pilot projects. 
Um, there's a more complicated history of Heron's Head. It, it is, I, it may still be there, tiny trace. Uh, the first plants were mis, um, misfired. <laughs> they were aimed uh, at uh, some uh, upland transition zone in serpentine rubble hill. They did not thrive there. Uh, the founder population died, uh, but the seedlings that were derived from the seed, the, as the plants were dying, they produced seed. Some of those seeds found the natural equivalent habitat in these mixed sand shell gravel oyster ridges, oyster shell ridges, and they thrived for 10 years. Um, but that short south facing shoreline where they naturally jumped and colonized by themselves, that eventually gave out. And um, it's near complete erosion of, of all the habitat and the plants in 2017. Um, but it also colonized India Basin, um, at least for a while, and the PG&E um, shoreline of the south. So it's been spreading around, but again, on, on the whole, extirpated. However, um, we, Port of San Francisco is now um, uh, sponsoring a, a, a Heron's Head Shoreline Resilience Project. Notice the title, not Habitat Restoration Project, but Shoreline resilience aimed at erosion control and sea level rise adaptation. It's going to get funded, I'm pretty sure. The basis of design report is prescribing from, by uh, ESA, a uh, consulting firm in the Bay Area and elsewhere, uh, prescribing coarse gravel beaches with retention structures or drift sills, the groins to hold the gravels in place. And uh, the intent is to work with Professor Boyer at uh, SFSU and do new experimental plantings of California sea blight, probably from Pier 94. So it may get a second bite at um, Pier 94, or Pier 98, uh, sorry, uh, Heron's Head. And uh, this is important because um, regionally, gravel beaches have been recommended as uh, one of the most resilient shore forms we can place in areas that would otherwise be restricted to traditional engineered armored shorelines, uh, hard riprap. And here's a natural example at uh, Point Pinole, East Bay Regional Parks, and a facsimile example, which is pretty pretty natural in its appearance, at uh, Aramburu Island in Richmond Bay um, on land owned by Marin County Parks and managed by California Audubon, Richmond Bay Audubon Society. So Sueda may be able to find home in the a new generation of manufactured gravel beaches, Another, um, another uh, aspect of gravel and coarser beaches is at Pier 94, as you can see on the left, is that uh, cobble salt marshes are also uh, a variant of typical salt marshes. They're sort of hybrid between beaches and rocky shores and salt marshes, but these can be combined with gravel beaches to provide even more shore protection, again, without going to traditional armoring. So a combination of relatively coarse resistant substrates mixed to be compatible with plants uh, can provide both vegetative cover habitat roughness um, at the surface for friction of waves that drags the waves down and reduces wave runoff and flooding these may all fit together in a new uh, living shoreline context and if you're wondering if if Sueda Californica will really thrive in gravel beaches. Uh, this is the uh, marina in Morro Bay. It's a pure gravel sand spit with very healthy, uh, spontaneously, not, not restored or planted uh, um, uh, California sea blight. And here is a high recreational use shoreline, a boat launch on completely artificial non-native oyster shells. It's a, an oyster shell dump that forms a beach. And um, despite people parking their upended kayaks and canoes on Sueda, thrives in a high use shoreline on very coarse a natural substrate. It also grows up coastal sand bluffs up to about four meters. Um, so it's not restricted to shoreline. You can see it, it can survive erosion up on the bluff and then creep back down and colonize the shoreline where it traps eel grass and sand and helps rebuild the beach. So very versatile ecosystem function. It has another peculiar trait of having a scandent habit, habit a growth habit. It's um, a facultative trait. It doesn't always reach up, but if it has support, it will grow up anything around it. Here is a shoreline population of coast live oaks, Quercus agrifolia, and you can see it growing up about two meters into the low hanging branches 
of the, this uh, elfin oak forest at Bay, uh, Bay, Baywood Park in uh, Morro Bay. And um, uh, you'll see it also is not picky about it. it grows up. That's horse fencing for pedestrian exclusion. And it grows up and over the fence. This is not just a novelty. In San Francisco Bay, one of the critical limiting, habitat, uh, uh, limiting habitats for wildlife management is um, a high tide refuge for uh, endemic marsh mammals and birds like uh, Ridgeway's rail and salt marsh harvest mice. Well, pickleweed can do this, but only in a limited way. California sea blight with some kind of support structure like coarse woody debris, uh, not dependent on earthen mounds or construction of earthen berms, may be able to pry, uh, supply um, a high tide refuge habitat in fairly remote areas where it is difficult to bring earth moving equipment and crews to build high, high marsh mounds. So this is also being investigated by Professor Boyer and her students. Uh, some of the other <laughs> peculiar traits of, of Sueda, even in guano barrens, toxic with ammonia and, um, and urea. This is a cormorant roost site where basically all the vegetation under it is, is denuded. That bright green spot, <laughs> two species, ice plant and much more robust California sea blight. Um, it thrives on high nutrient concentrations, including ammonia. Uh, and I don't know how far it can get in under that guano, but it is physiologically capable of tolerating more extremes than any other single salt marsh plant native to California that I've ever seen. It also has a well, poorly documented but significant trait of being able to tolerate sand burial like a dune plant. In fact, it is a dune plant at a high slip face on the lagoon shore of Morro Bay where it gets four to five meters above the high tide line before finally exhausting itself. So high burial tolerance, uh, potential applications in San Francisco Bay shores in beach restoration projects, not just bordering salt marshes, but an actual um, dunes. Uh, finally, its biggest potential application for engineered shorelines is the fact that it can colonize unengineered riprap shorelines that have a little bit of interstitial sand or earthen fill. This is um, the, marine, the State Parks Marina at Morro Bay and Tidewater Park, which is basically downtown uh, Morro Bay's shoreline. These are not plantings of California sea blight. These are invasions of California sea blight among ice plant, uh, where it overtops the ice plant and grows up onto the pavement. It gets trimmed back by mowers. Um, it actually <laughs> grows over the railings and at boat, boat docks, uh, completely covers the um, non-engineered boulder revetment. That's concrete blocks like we have in all of our Richmond shoreline. It just mantles it. So again, it, it is not a delicate plant. Um, it may have some recruitment limitations, it may have some, some uh, seed dispersal limitations and seed source populations, but brought to the right uh, habitats, it can do remarkable things, even in urban settings. And again, just to um, drive home that very important point for San Francisco Bay salt marshes, probably not so much for San Francisco per se, but for most of the South Bay, here is a pelican uh, roosting site, and possibly a nesting site, I'm not sure, on an island that is elevated about two and a half feet by a large uh, California sea blight mound. You can see the height of the adjacent pickleweed. It's nearly prostrate. And they are, that is not high ground. That is just the mound formed by um, uh, uh, California sea blight canopy. So again, potential ecosystem engineer for high tide refuge habitat in San Francisco Bay. But best of all, and I'll close off, <laughs> getting, getting down to the end, uh, its ability to uh, adapt to retreating shorelines by its clonal growth habit. It can establish at the high tide line, form a root system, clone by spreading laterally and layering, the buried stems will root independently. The seaward part of the plant can completely erode. The original root system can be completely undermined and eroded but the landward layers of rooted stems can persist. So as a beach retreats, Lamus can retreat with it. It's kind of like sand beach surfing in slow motion. Every time there's an overwash event, the landward parts of the plant get buried by sediment, the seaward parts erode. Um, this example is at Emeryville Crescent. This is one of the 2000, 2008 pilot project. 
it's still there, but not in its original position. It has rolled landward with this um, uh, artificial <laughs> gravel beach that's eroded from 1950s fill and rubble. Um, again, this is 2019, this is about 11 years later, and the original beach position it was placed in is pretty much gone. Uh, so this is, this is now transgressing over pickleweed marsh that was behind the original beach and the original planting, and it's just rolling along with it. So with some kind of coarse sediment nourishment, this could probably be sustained for quite some time. And like foredune plants, it may help the beaches build vertically and retain more sediment, increasing its resilience. Okay, I'm at the end, sorry for the uh, usual traditional overrun, but I just wanted to compare the differences between the roles of these species as ecosystem engineers in living shoreline projects or you know, nature-based coastal infrastructure versus our traditional ecological restoration projects. Um, obviously the goals differ. Um, these ecosystem services are the primary goal for um, uh, uh, climate adaptation projects. And, and biodiversity may be a secondary but important goal, but that doesn't mean that you can't coattail a lot of other species um, to go that are compatible with these um, artificially engineered environments that the uh, coastal plant ecosystem engineers um, are, are designed for. So we may be able to um, bootstrap some restoration goals in projects that would probably never be for ecological restoration in a pure sense. And also given our urban geography now, um, it may be that uh, sea level rise adaptation projects may and provide an entryway for native plants that would never be available for restoration because they're incompatible with infrastructure. But and, uh, sea level rise adaptation projects may actually be able to bring them where they otherwise wouldn't be funded or, or permitted. And uh, anyway, there's not much choice because sea level rise and uh, erosion and flooding are going to force complete reconfiguration of our coasts, whether we like it or not. So we may as well bring in as many um, species that we can get on the lifeboat um, as we can. So I'm not giving up on restoration, but um, this is a big bandwagon with a lot of money and a lot of engineering that's going to pretty much have to go in. So um, it's an opportunity and I don't want to miss it. That's it. All right, up, Peter. Thank you. We very much appreciate all the uh, positive examples out there. Gives us hope. Mm -hmm. Sorry for the timing. <laughs> no, 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 not at all, man. We're, we enjoyed it all, and uh, and and the crowd held in too. They're still here, and they've got some questions. If you don't, uh, if they have the stamina after hearing me talk for over an hour, well, they, they can drop yeah. out whenever. But so far, <laughs> they haven't. Okay. So. Um, so may, maybe if I could just, you want me to just uh, voice a couple of questions for me? There's not so many, sure. but uh, a few. Um, Susan asked, will the vegetation include more of San Francisco's native beach plants other than grass like silky beach pea? And then you, uh, after she asked that, you showed some examples. Um, I think she's also mentioned- Yeah, pink, I'll, pink I'll take that. Beer. I'll take that as invitation to sneak back in slides that I had to take out because I was way over time um, in slide number. But yeah, I, I had to leave out a, a, a little segment on pink sand verbena, which occurs as a, um, uh, actually there's hybrid pink sand verbena at Chrissy Field. And we have a distinct population segment from Marin to San Mateo that is not like um, uh, Monterey and South, which is a back dune, stabilized back dune plant. Our pink sand verbena is a perennial beach and fordune plant like Lamus. And it's more similar to the North Coast um, special status North Coast sand verbena variety Breviflora. That's another one that, especially with beach nourishment projects where the beaches are going to be, are basically programmed for repeated erosion and replacement, that favors annuals. Um, but they require, they, I'll cut to the point, uh, Pink sand verbena is a very vulnerable species because it depends on sort of a floating and embedded seed bank in the sand. In other words, it recycles its buried seed banks that have built up over many decades. 
So when there's beach erosion, they all go in the water and they wash back up. So if you don't have a massive number of seeds, they kind of wink out and they do. We've lost most of our populations. That's why it's probably at Chrissy Field because it's low energy. But if we can artificially build up a large reservoir of pink sand verbena, that's another species that may be able to bootstrap itself back into a more sustainable population size. It also historically grew on the Bay Shore um, and same place as Sueda. So it actually was kind of a neighbor of both Sueda and, and uh, uh, well, Lamus probably wasn't there, but it, it will be, it probably will be, it is now. Um, so yeah, I think that there are a lot of other species. Um, you know, Pacific wild rye can uh, fit in the, the back dunes an infrequent species, but we may not be able to fit all of the species <laughs> in everywhere. Um, I just would point out that in the South Ocean Beach restoration projects, there's a long list of potential stable back dune species. Um, I was actually pitching for Lysingia germanorum, but you know, everyone's allergic to endangered species, but it really would be harmless there. I mean, it, it's exactly the habitat. It, it's a weed. I mean, it is a, it's like a tar weed. Uh, it's very similar to tar weed. Um, it doesn't get in anyone's way and it's um, prolific. So yeah, there are lots of other places where you could have them coattail on the primary habitats. And if we can get you know, agencies to relax or sign memoranda of agreement saying, we won't hold you responsible if they die, <laughs> uh, some, something like that. Yeah, it's, that's, that's sad that uh, they're uh, afraid to try, but... Uh... It's, it's pervasive. <laughs> Mm. We have a question from Laura, and um, she asks, will the observed uh, reduction in fog over the last few decades impact the usefulness of Lamus mollus to these badly needed shoreline restoration projects for climate ad adaptation? Put it this way, if it's growing, thriving in Morro Bay and still in Point Sal, where it wasn't you know, known from Santa Barbara, back uh, when W.S. Cooper was doing his cross California dune surveys, if it's growing in Southern California now, um, well, South Central Coast, I bet it will do okay. I, I think it will not, it, it definitely, look, it likes wet beaches. Um, it likes moist beaches. It, it becomes more abundant and more dominant the further north you go. It, Alaska, it's just um, a very prominent species. Um, but it's kind of at its range limits down here. I do expect some increase in stress, but in terms of whether it would be excluded, um, no, I don't think it's gonna, it may be diminished. Like a lot of species are gonna endure higher stress levels and probably reduce growth rates and maybe uh, more population contractions, but I wouldn't predict it'll become extirpated. Maybe maybe uh, in Santa Barbara, <laughs> I have a harder time. Yeah. Uh, Bob asked, uh, and we've seen this very thing on the Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico coast, um, could footbridges be built that would limit trampling and prevent blowouts? There are a lot of easier ways. Um, you, you can build uh, pedestrian cross over crossings. Here's the problem with any hard structure. Dunes move, storms happen. Anything you put in a fixed place in a dune it's it's not just a gamble. It is um, it, it's just like waiting for a disaster to happen. Short shelf life. I, I would rather see here. Here there is really simple and much cheaper to maintain options like what they're doing right now. One of my suggestions actually at South Ocean Beach. You know, there's a lot of waste sand produced by sand mining where they some of it's engineering grade, construction grade, some of it's not. You can take that non-commercial coarse sand that's mixed with shell and other things they don't want in cement mixes. And you can place it over paths in, in dunes. Coarse sand does not blow or minimally blows. So you don't even have to have a structure. You could have symbolic fencing, just saying, you know, prefer you to walk here. You could place brush matting, like loose brush, stabilize the sand. It makes it very unpleasant to walk. Uh, not particularly good beach fuel for beach fires. So just making a pathway um, like what we have at Sloat right now with a coarse sand surface, um, it's not ADA approved. You need those special geotextile mats for that, but what a great platform for those. Non-engineered structure. So when a storm comes, 
you don't have to get half a million dollar budget to rebuild a boardwalk. And if you do need to have ADA access, which is reasonable, you have it at Percusi Field, there are uh, geotextile fabrics you can lay over firm sand and it makes the sand surface act like a paved surface. Um, much easier to roll that up and replace it than to rebuild a wooden structure. Cool. Um, David asks, uh, what is the reality of seagrass restoration at the northern end of Ocean Beach? And is RPD willing to make this happen, do you think? I don't think San Francisco um, Parks and Rec owns any uh, intertidal or subtitle habitat, so it wouldn't be in their jurisdiction. I suspect that would actually be part of a, I don't know, a marine sanctuary. Um, I don't know who owns the submerged lands. Um, I, 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 I assume, yeah, it's funny. That there's a lot of Zostra Marina restoration and transplanting. I don't know if any of the, the surf grasses um, are currently studied for expansion. I also don't know that they're declining uh, at the same, well, actually San Francisco Bay Zostra seems to be expanding in the decadal scale. Uh, and that may have to do with the uh, erosion of gold rush sediments. Uh, Bay's not as muddy as it used to be. Bad for marsh restoration. Cl water clarity is good for Zostra. Seems to be expanding often in sandy areas, very close to, to, um, to uh, the reintroduced and historic populations of, um, of California sea blight. In Morro Bay, eelgrass actually nourishes um, uh, sea blight, and uh, the two may, may be part of the same same relationship of, uh, anyway, I, I don't know about offshore sea grasses. Um, if there's a problem, yeah, someone could look at it, but I, I don't think, the one, ones in Pacifica, uh, the surf grass populations by, by uh, Lindemar Beach, those have been perfectly stable um, for decades. Um, Lou asks, if you think, uh, do you think another try at Chrissy and now Quartermaster Reach would be worth a retry? Um, how impacted is Sueda to prolonged fresh water? Uh, it loves fresh, fresh water. Like it goes better at that, that, uh, that big mounding example I showed at Tidewater Park where it's swallowing the ice plant. There's a leaky pipe there, a uh, broken irrigation pipe. <laughs> it, just, it just drove it to, uh, to, to uh, frenzied growth. Um, it's not the fresh water. Here, here's the thing. I think Chrissy Field, not, not to discourage an attempt, um, but Sueda does best in high, higher energy, alternating erosion, deposition, dynamic shores. Um, those examples with the challenging erosion and washovers, it actually does better where there's a lot of uh, rack deposition, sand movement, and the competition is knocked out by disturbances. So if you get to the quartermaster reach, you're at the lowest energy part of the shore, the most sheltered shore, competition is greatest. That is not a place where it naturally would seed in. Um, seedlings wouldn't occur there. And frankly, establishing it with a lot of root competition is not that easy. Um, the reason it failed at Chrissy right away was because it was done in the era before they managed the, um, the tidal inlet. Tidal inlet naturally closes at that position because of longshore drift and lack of protection from refracted swelling from the Golden Gate. So it will always, as long as there is, um, closure or reduction of tidal range, the vegetation is gonna tend to close in along that shoreline. We had a window when it probably would have been establishable at um, Chrissy. I, I wonder though, if it might not be easier to establish it actually on the bay side, on the Golden Gate side in some of the transition zones. As, as I pointed out in Mora Bay, it's pretty compatible with areas of trampling. I mean, you could probably put it, even on the rocks under the bridge. Um, <laughs> if I had to try one place at Chrissy Field, not natural, but I would, I would bet it would do better on interstitial sand fills on the riprap under the bridge than it would in the Quartermaster Reach. Unsolicited advice. <laughs> Uh, well, that is fascinating. It's a fascinating plant, and uh, we've really been enjoying seeing the uh, pygmy blue butterflies yeah. on it out at, uh, out at Pier 94. There was just so many of them this year. Mm -hmm. I did not know that. I was not there this year. Mm. Yeah, it was a good year for them. Yeah. Good. And, good. and we're, we're so grateful to you for uh, sharing all your expertise and knowledge with us, and it's a very fun story about these plants. Well, thanks for staying with me uh, 
two and pass the bitter and <laughs> have a long yeah, time. I'm nothing bitter about it all. It's all sweet, man. <laughs> okay. Really thank appreciate you, so you being here. Thanks. And thank uh, you, thanks you. everybody for hanging. We'll look forward to being with you again. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.